Welcome to the School of Bravery. My name is Emily Ann Peterson. We have Chris Marie Campbell and Susan Clark with us today. Hi, you guys. Good. Hi. I'm so glad that you're here with us. Um, we were just, they were just asking me about how I got started with the School of Bravery and I thought I would like start the interview now. So, um, <laughs> cause, cause I started as, you know, as a cellist and as a musician, professional cellist and cello teacher and about six years ago now six ish years ago now I was diagnosed with a hand tremor in my right hand um, and that prompted me to go off and do different things for economical reasons economic reasons and just because it was very clear that my body was not able to sustain making a living off of it for eight hours a day um, and that everyone kept telling me I was being really brave and I didn't feel very brave. Mm. And that triggered me to go like, wait, I must not know what bravery is. Mm. And so then that, because of just my personality type, I like to research things that sent me off on this like whole, you know, rabbit trail of what is bravery. And I interviewed a bunch of people on that podcast. Um, Bare Naked Bravery is now the school of bravery. Mm -hmm. um, and it became a book. And the mm -hmm. book has 12 ingredients of bravery. And those 12 ingredients, we go through one every single month in the school of bravery. So this month we have, this month's ingredient is friction, <laughs> which is why I invited you guys <laughs> this month. <laughs> I kind of got that when you, I was listening to you talk about friction and I thought, oh, this is right up there with conflict yes. in an yeah, earlier podcast. Yeah. So there's three main ingredients of bravery. There's uh, vulnerability, imagination, and improvisation. Mm -hmm. And friction is part of improvisation. Ah, like cool. when you feel friction, you have to improvise around it within your feet of bravery, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and so I wanted to bring you guys on because you, you've written a book, you've done a wonderful things in the realm of talking about conflict. Um, and your book, which just came out a couple of days ago. Yes. It's called The Beauty of, yes. There it is. Yeah, there there the, it beauty. Is. <laughs> the Beauty of Conflict for Couples. And you also have another book for teams as well, right? Yes. Yeah, that's this, this is oops, Maybe books falling. <laughs> yeah, beauty of conflict. And this is if we could rename it, it would be beauty of conflict for business teams. Yeah. Not teens, T A M S. <laughs> business teams. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so and you know, the students of the School of Bravery are people who are in relationships, but also people who have careers and creative careers as well. So yeah. I know that both of those books would probably apply to my students and also my fans as well. So um, I want to just give a little, I'm going to read your bios really quick um, so that we know who we're going into. Um, so Chris Marie Campbell, an Olympic rower, Boeing flight test engineer, has, um, has her MBA, and Susan Clark, a former marriage therapist and Equus, is that how you say that? Equus? Yes, Equus coach. Yeah, Equus coach. <laughs> they are both the authors of The Beauty of Con Conflict, Harnessing Your Team's Competitive Advantage, and their forthcoming book, which is already out, <laughs> The Beauty of Conflict for Couples. Um, as, as partners in work and life for over two decades, they've adopted their proven step-by-step -step process, honed working with Fortune 100 companies such as Johnson & Johnson, Microsoft, AT&T, and San Francisco Giants to help long-term couples use conflict as a catalyst to greater intimacy, passion, and fulfillment. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. All cool. of those things. <laughs> um, can you talk about friction in relationships? I was, yeah, this is Chris Marie. And I was thinking about just because you're in the creative realm and, you know, brain science has shown creativity comes when our brain is trying to hold two paradoxical ideas and then it, it creates these new neural pathways that that's what you get in the shower. Like, oh my gosh, this is the idea. Those, those <laughs> aha moments. 
So uh, conflict in relationship is very similar, though we're not as comfortable with that, is holding the tension between these two different ideas. And rather than diffusing it or trying to make it go away, which is typically what we are trained to do because none of us had good role models, we, you know, it's it was, uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> so, but we have found that when you can hold that tension, that's when new ideas come and the creativity and innovation, that's where the beauty of conflict comes in. And we didn't, we didn't call either book the joy, the ease, the fun of conflict, because it's not. But when you can learn to tolerate that tension inside of you and between you and another person, that's when amazing things happen. And it's happened in our couple, it's happened in business teams, and it's happened with the couples that we work with over and over and over again. Can you talk, because one of the things that I'm always talking about is that people are people, just people in general, are think that bravery needs to be a lot harder than it mm. probably should be. Um, they think that like the feat of bravery is this big, big, huge thing. And then they will self-sabotage it in a, even not fully, but in a subtle way by making it harder than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that happening in relationships as well with conflict? Yeah. Oh, sure. It, you know, people, uh, well, I, I, I want to actually, before I directly answer that, I, I want to say, you know, in some respects, I think you were talking about it when you talked about your own experience of bravery, just when we started, like people would say to you, you know, you're so brave this, and you were like, I, I don't feel I, that way. I don't feel that way. And, um, I know for myself, I mean, Earlier in my life, I had a whole seven years of cancer and different things that I worked with. And people would all, now then the big word was courage, which is another form of bravery. But they, I would, people would always say, you're so courageous. And I'd be like, I, I don't feel courageous. I'm just doing one step at a time to keep my, be as alive as I can be. She was given six months to live at the point. But, the, but my, a friend, my mentor said to me, he said, you know, courage, when people tell you you're courageous and brave, they basically say that because right in that moment, they don't want to have your life. So it's a lot <laughs> easier to say you're courageous and brave, but you have your life. So you are having to just face it one step at a time. And, you know, that I think is very hard to do because we are so future focused or past focused. And so the reason I think bravery becomes so hard is because we usually tend to look at something behind us or something ahead of us. And bravery really comes when we can embrace that moment in the present. And mm -hmm. often that isn't as hard. I mean, it, it's, it, is, it is hard to stay in the present because we are so driven to look behind us or to look ahead. And, but it is, it becomes easy when you realize, oh, the present moment is where bravery actually comes from. It's and, and even in relationship, where that present moment comes from is so often we're like, we don't want to rock the boat because we're doing so well. <laughs> I don't want to upset the apple cart, all these phrases that we say. And bravery in the moment is risk saying, hey, this is how I really feel. I'm upset. Rather than keeping that in, in, inner conflict, like I'm really not happy, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sweep it under the, my rug so I can tolerate this. It's actually having the courage to risk, maybe even risk a reaction or risk somebody even saying, I don't want to be with you, to actually feel more alive and in yourself and then be interested in the other person. Mm -hmm. So having the vulnerability, we talk about that too, vulnerability and curiosity. So having the vulnerability to risk saying what's true and also being interested and curious about the impact and how it lands over there. Mm -hmm. So when you encounter couples who are having like in the midst of a, a pretty big season of conflict, mm -hmm. um, cause it's not one, it's probably like more than one conflict. Oh yeah. <laughs> recurring conflict. Yes. <laughs> well, we'd say people think it's the big things that end a relationship and it's really a lot of little things that weren't addressed. And so then it leads to that behavior of the big thing, like the affair or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do you, how do you unstack all those little things? Once you realize like, oh my gosh, I have had, I've built up all these tiny little resentments against this person, romantic or otherwise. How do you mm -hmm. unstack all those? Well, you know, it's interesting. Again, this is one of those things. A lot of times people think, okay, I've now got to go through all of the baggage. 
Very rarely do you have to go through all of them, but you have to start being real about some of them. And, you know, when that occurs, it can, uh, it will help other things fall into place. Like that's how people can drop resentment is when they actually start to show up and are more self-defined, more real in the moment. It really does that the resentment stops because resentment really isn't about the other person. It's about how I haven't shown up. So once I've shown up on my own behalf, the resentment starts to go away. And so I don't have to go through 20,000 times I didn't show up. <laughs> I actually can start to realize, oh, well, I showed up this time and it's a different experience. And I think, I, I mean, I think one of your TED talk was on resonance. And the, and the idea is that when that moment of resonance occurs in the present moment, there's a healing that takes place in the past as, and in my opinion, even into the future. But that's a, that's, um, that's the possibility, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. So, okay. So let's say you're in the midst, like you're in, in a present argument. Yes. <laughs> and you're pulling in all these past things as like cards and you're laying them on the table and you're like, but you did yeah. this, but you did this. And oh this, yeah. Well, what about this? And, um, and what ifs, those are mm -hmm. always yes. like, what if you do this and what mm -hmm. if that happens and what if that, um, how can you like, is there an easy way to just like snap yourself and go like, no. So one, well, here, one of the here things I am, I'm right yeah. here in the present. <laughs> yeah. It's to actually recognize, I, and we talk about this in the book, how to deal with anger when it starts to come out. We, we have a process called a Vesuvius. Like I need some time just to vent and that can support. And then usually what happens, the reason I'm bringing out all those cards is because I'm so upset. I feel so unheard, unlistened to. Mm -hmm. And so now something snapped and I'm going to let you have it. And really what's underneath is I, is that feeling of feeling unseen, unheard, and like, I don't matter. And when I can kind of vent the anger, if my partner can hold for it and they can reflect back, not all the 20 things, all the 20 cards I've pulled, but it sounds like, wow, you feel really unsupported by me. That is a, that's like, oh, like, yes. So, and we even have a process in the book called a, a boundarying process where you can start to bring, hey, this is what I do want and this is what I don't want, but much in a much more responsible way. Um, but how to deal with the anger when it's kind of bubbling up, that would be more how, you know, we have that Vesuvius process in the, in the book. And we talk about in a couple, the critical thing is one, the willingness to be vulnerable and bring that up and to know how to ask for permission, create some space where there's some boundarying that needs to take place for that to happen. But the person who's on the receiving side mm -hmm. also needs to be able to regulate their own nervous system so they can hang in. Because as soon, I mean, the, prob, the biggest problem that happens with couples is if she's mad about something, then 90% of the time it's about me. <laughs> and and, no and her being different. And, I want you to change. <laughs> and I, it is very hard to just hold and listen to that without wanting to defend, interject and say, but that wasn't my intention. And so, you know, it really does become, how can I create the space? This isn't about me changing or being different, but to just create a space for her to be who she is. And that takes me being willing to understand what do I need to do in the moment to regulate my nervous system so I don't just go off and take it on. And sometimes that may be a matter of creating a little more space. Physically, it, like backing up yeah, <laughs> or time, space. Taking, breath, you know, I may need to say, look, I'm okay if you have a lot you have to say, but you need to just say it with blah, blah, blah. If you, <laughs> if you give me too many specifics of all the reasons you're mad at me, I can't hear you. So there might be ways that I could create the space. Um, so that, you know, we talk about both people have a role to play in being able to uh, create a space where people can show up fully. Each one of them can show up fully. Yeah, I, I love that. I'm just thinking of like the moments in my career or in my personal life where a Vesuvius has happened. <laughs> <laughs> Either I have been the Vesuvius or on the receiving end of it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And because I've, you know, it's been both ways, right? Mm -hmm. But I bet it wasn't with permission. I no. probably was a, a, a spontaneous <laughs> vent. That's, a, he was That's spontaneous. A, yeah. He was spontaneous. But uh, the, when you first mentioned a Vesuvius exercise, I was like, my first thought was, 
(laughs) How do you, like, how do you, if you're on the receiving end of that, immediately I was thinking, how Mm -hmm. do you, like, sit there and listen to that? Can I, sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I mean, it's true. It can be a challenge, but you know, what's interesting is when I used to do more marriage and family therapy, I worked with kids, small children, and most of them, a lot of them were dealing with ADD, different family issues with their family. And I would teach them ways to do a Vesuvius. And inevitably they were like, can you, will you teach my parents? (laughs) And so, you know, one of the funnest parts was bringing the, uh, the parents in and having the, the, their, their kids introduce them to this idea of a Vesuvius because the biggest thing is one asking permission. So that takes, that usually changes it. Um, being willing and saying, you know, what words can I use and what words can't I use is sometimes with, with children, it was important. If it was going to be explicit, they needed to know that. And, you know, the other piece was, can I hit things? And only if it's only if you make it safe cushions, things that are comfortable and then how much time and, inevitably it you know for the parents they were so afraid of their kids you know hearing them and their kids would go oh no it'll be okay as long as i can keep time and they would have little you know, and it's like, usually two minutes is a lot that's because a long. <laughs> if you really like when it just spontaneously erupts it feels like it can go you start spinning and you're going on and on but if you actually take conscious two minutes to say i'm going to really with permission and that boundary the physical boundary everything and really let myself express mm-hmm you kind of run out of steam, yeah. which is a really healthy thing. We're so afraid of our own anger and other people's because my dad was an army colonel and violent growing up. So anger is Velcroed to violence mm-hmm. and they're two separate things. We get, we get trained that they're the same and they're not. Anger is that rising up when our boundaries have been crossed or something injustice has been done. That's a healthy response. But we're, especially as women, so we got to be nice and polite mm-hmm. and we really repress that anger. But that is life force it's creativity it's aliveness it's part of your sexual energy a lot of it's really healthy so learning to access it in healthy ways is really powerful mm-hmm. i once had a friend client who's also a therapist tell me that anger is an emotion that points to a deeper emotion mm-hmm. and anger is an emotion that prompts action. Yeah, it's anger comes up when uh, I think when somebody's crossed my boundary yes. and or I'm not ta- I'm not taking care of my own boundary. So it allows that and often what's underneath that anger is valuable and then what's underneath it is I feel so hurt or unseen, you know, there's that underlying piece. But I don't get to that without going through my anger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I I Hesitate to call it because it also used to get labeled a secondary emotion, which just used to always kind of, that used to just sort of piss me off. <laughs> it's got you angry. You know, huh? got me angry, <laughs> you know, because it is a, it is a vital uh, energetic aspect of who we are. And yeah. so that's the only reason I don't mind saying there's always stuff underneath it, but I, I actually do like to say, Hey, in and of itself, it is a, vital part of our expression and our energy system. And it does move us forward yeah. into like action. taking action. <laughs> like I've got to do something different. If it doesn't, that's when we get into like depression or really not taking care of ourselves because we're squishing cool. yeah. that and not acting so on our own behalf. All of the stories that are coming to mind right now are actually not relationship stories. They're actually stories of like moments as a solopreneur or someone who's in charge of her own career or um, witnessing other people, like even students in the School of Bravery who have, you know, um, someone in the School of Bravery this month, because we were talking about, we've been talking about friction all month long. She posted in the group that she noticed something was causing friction in her career. She drew a line. Mm -hmm. And it scares her to draw that line because it means financial implications, Mm -hmm. but she feels so much better about it. Yeah. Yes. And, and I, I, and the fact that conflict can, um, can agitate you enough to make a change Mm -hmm. for better. Mm -hmm. Yes. How is that a bad thing? 
It isn't a bad thing. We're just terrified yeah. of the reason. Like we're terrified of, oh, you're going to get mad at me or I'm going to lose the job or the business or the client. I mean, this happened with a corporate client. We were, we were doing a leadership development thing for them and they just kept changing and wanting. And I, eventually this is a, like a year and a half in and I'm like, and we still hadn't done the training. And I finally got clear and I was like, oh, I how can I bend myself in this way? And I'll run over here and do it this way. Like I was running myself into a pretzel, turning myself into a pretzel. And finally somebody said, uh, it was Susan and somebody else like, I think you need to set a line. And I said, you know what? We're this, we're not a fit. You know, we're going to give this to you. We'll help you find somebody else to do it, but this is not a match. And I really thought we'd be done. And I had made peace with losing the money, whatever. And turns out they just totally did a 180 and fell over themselves to like, wait, 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 look, well, you know, and I never would have learned that. I would have kept running, kept being the one to run around and try to please them because that's really my MO, trying mm -hmm. to please people versus saying, no, this doesn't fit for me. And I didn't make them wrong. I just said, this isn't working for me. So here, let me help you do something different. And it was powerful. Right. Well, I think, you know, leading, um, running your own business, being a creative, being in a relationship with people. These are all parts. These are all like the hardest, most <laughs> beautiful parts of being a human that, um, are, that can like bring the best and the worst out of you. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it, go I, I was thinking though about what you're saying, you know, I can, in a way, the same is true in a relationship because so often people think of a relationship as it's like, okay, now we're one. Well, no, you're, you're one with two equal individual people in it. And all too often that gets lost. So the very same thing applies. How do I stay a me in the face of a we? And that is so vital to a successful relationship. And yet, so many of the TV scripts and things we've heard about don't make it sound like that. They don't, they don't fully honor there's a full me inside a we. And if there's not, the math demonstrates that if we have a relationship math, we say one whole person times another whole person equals a whole relationship. Mm -hmm. But what happens is I, I decide, oh, well, I'm going to hold back because, you know, she may not like me, so I'll show up halfway. Mm -hmm. she, Susan shows up full. We have a half a relationship, a half times one. And if we both say, well, you know, she doesn't like this, she doesn't like that. So one half times one half equals a quarter. There's diminishing returns on the relationship the less I show up all of me. Mm -hmm. So we're really making a case to encourage sure. people to show up as your full self, your Whether full me. In a, in a couple, but also in your business, in, in your creativity. Those, because there's, that's so reliant upon relationships. And yeah. one is a relationship to yourself, which okay. sometimes gets lost. Right. So, yeah. Well, I just, think, I just think that what you're doing is so, so important. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one of the things I always say about bravery is that it is needed, it's worth it, and um, it's really valuable. And so thank you for listening to that and doing what you do. And um, I would love to have, you know, we always do like a, a behind the scenes interview and I would actually love to talk with you guys about this exciting project that I'm doing this weekend because uh, we were talking about it before we started <laughs> recording. So um, I'm recording um, a song that I've been sitting on for a year. Um, about uh, Christine Blasey Ford's testimony um, mm. at, at Brett Kavanaugh's Senate Judiciary hearing. Um, and I'm going to go up to D.C. this weekend and record it in front mm. of the Supreme yes. Court. Yes. Oh! Wow. So <laughs> Very powerful. We started talking about how that is a, like, it's a prime example of, like, wow, like public conflict, conflict mm -hmm. and like political conflict and all of that. And so we're going to go have that conversation and um, do that 
for the students of the School of Bravery. Yeah. And if you would like to enroll in the school, you're more than welcome to go to schoolofbravery.com and go to beautyofconflict.com, right? That's the book. Yeah, we have, we have a podcast, The Beauty of Conflict. We have a website, The Beauty of Conflict, Beauty of Conflict, not The Beauty of Conflict. And our books are called Beauty of Conflict. So <laughs> it's really easy to find us. And I'll put, um, there's a link to a free chapter of the book as well. Yes. And so I'll put that in the show notes as well. So um, everybody will have access to that as well. So um, thank you guys so much for joining oh, us. Today. We've loved it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I'll see you guys over here in, in a little bit. Excellent. Okay. <laughs>